right, I will introduce our first panel. They are gonna talk about what happens after you pass away. We have Ms. Laura Dalton with Waldron Private Wealth. Dina Muldowney is a CPA with Carr, Riggs and Ingram. And Ms. Lisa Jo Spencer, attorney with Lisa Jo Spencer, PA. So I'm gonna get us started. Our topic is what happens after you pass away. It is obviously a very broad topic and some of you may have um, questions if you've ever been through the, the probate process or trust administration process or just have, have had to deal with a loved one passing away. Um, there's so many questions and so many different kinds of things that, that go into it. My practice focuses on probate, guardianship, and estate planning. So we touch on all the areas that we, that we get into um, here today that, that you'll be talking about. Um, but so basically, what happens? Well, we usually get a phone call, and probably my office as the, as, as the attorney, we're the one that usually gets the phone call first, but it may be the CPA or the financial planner. It depends on where the relationship is. And a family member will call and say, Oh my goodness, mom's passed away now. And my office's first response is, we are, of course, we are so sorry and we will, you know, we're here to answer whatever questions. Take care of your family first. Don't worry about all of the financial stuff and all of that. You love on your people. You take care of each other and you do your grieving. Now that's not to say that there aren't things that you can do to, to kind of make sure that everything's going the way it needs to because a, a lot of times people will, will wait and then there would have been things maybe we could have helped with. Um, so it's, it's okay to give that phone call, but focus on each other first. I think we'd all agree with that. Um, and so, you get, so we get the phone call. What happens? Well, the first thing we want to know is if, if it's not somebody we've worked with, is there a will? Is there a trust? You know, what kind of stuff? And so my, the, the attorney's office is going to ask a few questions of you to kind of work through it. Now, what the rest of today is going to be about is trying to avoid that probate process. <laughs> um, but a lot of times you just have to go through it. And, and it, even with the best estate plan, sometimes there's things that just cause you to have to go through the probate process. The legal office that you work with should guide you through that administrative piece in Florida, probate is pretty technical, and it takes a long time. So if you're from another state that does things easily, some states, they literally just have to take the will to the courthouse and, and pay 100 bucks or something, and it's blessed, and that's the end of it. They say, go do your thing, distribute property, and do all of that. If you're from one of those states, you are in for a very rude awakening if you have to do probate in Florida. And so that's why most of us in this room are we we push the you know get your affairs in order and avoid the probate process it's expensive and it's time consuming and that's money that comes away from your loved ones because you know the guess what the attorneys and the CPAs get paid first <laughs> um, but yeah so so you want to do that so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let these ladies talk about ways that they can help you with avoiding probate and there are things that we we talk about the one thing I think every single one of us that are in here will tell you is there is no cookie cutter for Ed for this. Um, estate planning is very, very tailored to what you own, who you, who you want to leave your things to, who you want to take care of you, because remember, it's not just what happens after you pass away, even though that's our topic, it's what's happening, you know, if you've had a stroke or something and somebody's got to help pay your bills. So, um, it, these, we'll let these ladies talk about some beneficiary designations and things like that. Sure. And again, I'm Dina Muldowney with Carr, Riggs & Ingram. And we also get the phone calls. And so, you know, one of our first questions is, do you have an attorney? Do you, you know, do you know who the deceased financial planner is? And we'll have them come in to the office because you kind of, even though during these times, sometimes a face-to-face -face can make somebody feel... <clears throat> less anxious about what's going on and they'll say you know I'm identified in the will to take care of this stuff and so usually my first thought is oh my gosh do you know what you've gotten yourself into <laughs> <laughs> and usually they have no idea so you know when you kind of go through the process of everything it can be overwhelming 
So we kind of identify the steps that need to be done. Then we'll put a timeline on those steps. There'll have be some homework, but that way they know they've got something to do, so they're doing something. So that makes somebody feel better. And then they know they have somebody that they can call. So that makes them feel better and they don't feel quite so overwhelmed. Like Lisa Joe said, it's usually a year at least sometimes to get all this stuff wrapped up, which people don't realize that's like signing on to a full-time job. <laughs> and if you ever go through it, you'll, you know what I'm talking about. So when we bring someone in, you know, we, do you, is there a will? Is there a trust? What kind of documents do you have? Do you have contact with the estate attorney? Do you need an estate attorney, which in most, you usually always do. So, you know, their first task is to identify what assets are owned. And we have several ways that we can do that. Since I do tax returns, a lot of the assets are identified on the tax return. So that's a good way to see what bank accounts are there, what investment accounts are there, retirement accounts, uh, property taxes that are being paid. So how those assets are titled determines what kind of processes will uh, go in place after that. So that's uh, pretty much the, the first thing. And then um, the, that also shows us how those assets are titled. So depending on how, how those assets are titled depends on if there will be a probate, if there's a trust, if things are held jointly, and then that will dictate the next steps uh, to move forward in the process. And so we rely heavily on the attorney to tell us what the language in those documents mean, to do probate if probate is needed, and then the investment advisor can confirm how assets are titled. There's a process you have to go through. You need to get the assets out of the social security number of the, of the decedent because <coughs> when someone passes away, the power of attorneys don't work anymore. So do they need to be officially appointed as the personal representative is something that has to be determined and the estate attorney will take care of that. Um, and um, so there could possibly be a probate if there's, uh, the financial advisor can tell you how those assets are titled, which can confirm how if we need federal identification numbers for say the estate, because the estate it could be required to file an income tax return. So the day that that person dies is the final day that's reported on their personal tax <coughs> return, the form 1040, and the estate starts. So the estate's responsible for an income tax return as well. And if there's a trust, the trust is responsible for an income tax return as well. So the financial advisor has a lot of roles and I'll let Laura talk about what some of their roles are. Hi, I am Laura Dalton. I work with Waldron Private Wealth. Um, so I'm just here to kind of talk about some of the headaches you can and tips and tricks that I have seen by going through this with my own family members and also clients as well. Um, one of the big things is beneficiary designations. That is reviewing any of the designations you have on your 401k, your 403b, IRAs. You want to make sure that that money is flowing to the right people. I have might have seen uh, maybe an ex-spouse on an IRA, and you don't want to get into that messy thing <laughs> at all. Um, but with that, there was something that happened in 2019 called the SECURE Act, where with an IRA and these retirement accounts, you were able to stretch them over a longer period of time. For example, if you were an 80-year-old and your spouse was no longer alive and you had a 40-year-old child, you could leave that money to the child in this retirement account but they could then stretch it over their lifetime, so 40 years. With the new rules, they have to take the money out within 10 years. That's a big change. And what a big change and why I bring that up is the tax planning that goes around it. When you're taking distributions out of an IRA, if it is not a Roth, um, they are ordinary income to the beneficiary. Now, people might think, 
like, oh, I'm dead, I'm in the ground. Like, I, my, my beneficiary can pay the taxes, but if you actually like your kids and you want to do some tax planning for them and you're not in the ski club, which I call the Spending Kids Inheritance Club, um, <laughs> you can actually do some planning for them ahead of time and you can do some Roth conversions and distribute some or do a distribution out of those retirement accounts and put them into the Roth and you would pay the tax. Another thing I want to bring up that seems kind of small are death certificates. Um, if you're ever going through the process with a spouse or you're the executor, please order more death certificates than what you think. Um, <laughs> They never tell you that every company under the sun is going to be asking you for death certificates, um, bank accounts, investment accounts, um, if you're filing a life insurance claim. Another thing, utility companies. If you think you hate your cable provider now, just wait. <laughs> um, so please order more death certificates. In the state of Florida, um, the first one's $15, and then the, the, uh, the subsequent ones are 4 so please order, um, there's two different kinds. There's a long form and a short form. The long form has the medical reason for death and the short form um, does not. So please just order a mix of both depending on, you know, like count how many th things you think you're gonna file a claim for. Another thing I kind of want to talk about is your actual credit. So if you have somebody that passed away, that you're an executor as well, please go to your credit reporting agencies and file a do not issue credit on that deceased um, social because no one can go and buy a new car or issue a new credit card into that social or go buy the new iPhone 12. So please go issue that thing and also in, in the state of Florida, as we all know, um, they go after the elderly and their fraud is very rampant down here, so please go um, put the fraud alert on there because we've all received the email from the Ethiopian prince that wants to, your cousin was in Europe and you need to spend $10,000 to get them out. I told them the keeper. But um, please do that. Um, it's, just a, it's just a helpful hint. And then something I wanted to touch on really quickly um, is Social Security. We could probably talk this entire day about Social Security. Um, but please file the, or file the death with Social Security as soon as possible. The funeral director usually does it, but just a rule of thumb, please reach out because if a distribution goes into your bank account and it's after the date of death, the deceased date of death, they're going to be looking for that money. Yeah. So you would have to pay it back. So please go and do that. And then if you are an actual beneficiary of the Social Security, please work with a trusted advisor on going through how to take that Social Security. There are so many nuances when it comes to Social Security of the age, um, what year, um, you know, like if, if there's a minor child involved, if there's a disability. So please work with anyone here on the state council or any of your trusted advisors to go through Social Security. These are the things that I have seen that cause major <laughs> headaches for families. So if you kind of keep these in mind before a death kind of prematurely happens, that they kind of, you're prepared for these things. If, if I could jump in. On your tables, and for those of you that are watching at home, I think RJ has a way for you to download this document. It's just, it's a little form that says important information on it. This is something that we created. Uh, we, we had stolen a, a, a form from the base that we liked, <laughs> but we've found that it has sort of aged, we've aged out of it because we realized it doesn't, it, it, that form didn't really account for people who um, handle banking online and do a lot of, a lot of online transactions. So there's no, there's no magic to this form. You can recreate it yourself. What this form is, is for your loved ones, and this is one of the things we always ask for. Did, you, did, did they have any kind of a list or any kind of a thing that tells you where their bills, what your bills are and, and where the assets are, kind of like what Dina was talking about. CPA is the best the the best person if, if we if we don't know where those things are you would be surprised maybe you wouldn't be um, but how many people come in and they have no idea where their where their loved one banked where you know where their who their financial advisor is who their CPA is what kind of bills they had and and all of those kind of things so what we the first thing we also tell somebody is anything that is an individual bill such as a credit card that's in an individual name of the decedent don't pay it until we tell you to because if there's there's all kind of rules on that and they may or may not ever get paid um, the good news is 
you are never personally responsible for those um, accounts that you didn't take out yourself. So even if it's something that was your spouse's credit card, and it's but it's in your spouse's name, your spouse passes away, it, it could have $25,000, $50,000. We've seen it. You can have it. But if there's no probate process, and so there's no what we call no non-exempt assets to pay those creditors, those bills don't get paid. Well, that, you don't know what a relief that is. We've had uh, several um, widows come in whose husbands had a gambling problem. We've had a couple of those where they had a gambling issue or something, and they hit it all these times, and then they've got these credit card bills, and they're like, well, what am I going to do? And we're like, good news is you don't have to pay it. The problem is what that may mean, <laughs> we may be making a discussion on, well, they've got, you know, there's a, there's an, a, a secret account, too, that's got $2,500 in it. Well, guess what? Forget that, because that $2,500 is going to go to that creditor. So, you know, we, we, we go through all of those kind of things, and just that little bit of a simple, don't pay that bill until we tell you. Now, the rule of thumb obviously would be pay the mortgage on any real estate and keep the power and all the utilities going on real estate so that you don't run into issues. But <clears throat> cancel the cable bill, unless, you're, unless somebody's going to be staying there and, and needs to have it on. But you can start canceling the cable bill. Cancel the landline. Cancel, you know, those kinds of expenses. Keep the, keep the yard guy on, and if there wasn't a yard guy, get a yard guy, because you want the house to continue to look like somebody lives there and it doesn't look run down. But those are the only bills that you really are going to, at the very beginning, keep going until, the, until your lawyer tells you what's going to happen with it. Um, and so I know that seems, seems crazy. And, every, and, and speaking about their credit, once you've passed away, you know what, we don't care if you have a good credit rating. Because that's, oh, my mom would be so upset if she knew I wasn't going to pay this bill. Well, you know, maybe, but the law says you don't have to, so don't do it. So, uh, and, and, you know, and sometimes it's a $50 bill or something, so the trouble of not paying it is, is almost worse than paying it. So, you know, there's, there's not a black and white, as with everything. Um, but but that's, what, that's what all of us are here to help you with. Um, the other thing in speaking about beneficiary designations, it's not just those big accounts that you've got with your financial advisor and, and um, you know, where your IRAs are and those sorts of things. That $500 credit union account that you've got so that you can have a good car loan or that is your Christmas mad money, please put beneficiary designations on those. Because if we've avoided probate for everything except that account, it's, not, it's going to cost more to try to get that money, and you've just left money on the table that could have gone to your family, could have been used to pay for your last expenses and those sorts of things. Um, I will tell you, the funeral home is one of the first bills that you do have to pay. Um, if there's insurance, they will work with you. They, they all have a different sort of a plan. Um, but they can hold your death certificates hostage, <laughs> and you can't do anything without a death certificate. So you, you've got to make those arrangements on how, that's, how that payment is going to be made. Um, so even though, you know, statutorily there's a method for them to get paid, the reality is you're going to pay them up front um, in some way or make some sort of arrangements with a life insurance policy that's coming in or something um, because you'll need those death certificates. And talking about the death certificates, there is no rhyme or reason to who wants a with cause of death and without cause of death. So you have to order a bunch of both. And there's, and we can always order more. I mean, we we we're, we routinely order them. A lot of times we have to order it for it'll it'll be the second spouse that's passed away. The first spouse, no probate was required, and so there's things that we have to do. So we'll have to order death certificates for for the the predeceased spouse and that sort of thing. But that's what we're all here to help you kind of walk through. Also, those beneficiary designation things and life insurance and all of those. Every company has their own way and own forms that um, to, to, for, for the beneficiaries to get the money that's coming to them. And sometimes, sometimes it's an easy process, sometimes it's not. Um, if you've got a, a, a trusted person that you've worked with the whole time and you've got a relationship with the company, obviously that's much easier because those folks are going to walk you through it. You're, you're, um, we've got several folks here that are in, in private banking and that sort of thing. Those guys are going to make it very smooth for your family members if you've got that kind of relationship. That doesn't mean that if, if you're at 
the credit union or whatever, wherever your accounts are, that they're not going to work with you. It just sometimes can be um, a lot smoother if you do have a trusted advisor. We're in a small town, um, and so that's nice because we do, I think almost all of us, have a personal relationship with a banker, no matter what bank that is. And so you can call around. All of us also, because we're in the Estate Planning Council, but also just because we're out and about in the community, have relationships with most of the local banks. Um, and so we can sometimes make those easier phone calls. We know there's, there's some tricks to the questions that you ask, because if you're not a beneficiary, they're not going to talk to you. Um, it's just that simple. Um, but we can ask some questions to know there's, there's um, formal administration probate, and then there's a summary administration that's much, much faster less expensive and um, much, yeah, it's much better to, to go through if you can qualify for it. We can usually get those answers from the financial institutions to know, because there's a cutoff on all that, to know, are they going to qualify for summary? <laughs> and they know that answer whenever, you know, they know when we're asking that question, they know what we're asking for and why we're asking it. They're not going to give us a dollar amount, but they'll say, no, you're going to have to file formal or yeah, you know what, this doesn't have that much in it. You'll probably be able to do it. And then the, and then we, the next question we'll say is, well, you know, summary administration is about $2,500. Is it going to be worth it? And they'll tell us yes or no on that, too. So we can kind of get those phrases. They probably won't tell you that but the, because we've got those relationships and they know we're not asking who's the beneficiary, blah, blah, you know, we're not asking those kind of questions. We're just trying to get some answers around around the bend so that we don't open a formal administration if we don't have to and that sort of thing. So um, like Lisa Day was talking about the funeral expenses and stuff. So, you know, once someone, we've uh, counseled somebody and they've identified the assets that the decedent owns, then we have to help them, again, transition those assets out of the Social Security number into the new entity and the new federal ID number for whatever is next. So if we know that there's individual assets, those will probably be transferred into an estate account under the estate ID number. If there's a joint account, it will transition to the joint owner with their social security number. If it's in a trust, then it'll transfer to a trust account under the trust federal ID number. So um, it's the day after that person passes away, the personal representative is responsible for keeping up with the income and expenses of the new entity. And the income and expenses will be reported on a new tax return and a new different kind of form. So all that has to happen before anything can be distributed to the beneficiaries. And so, you know, there's a lot that is involved before things can be distributed to the beneficiary. So once all that has been done and you've identified and paid all the final expenses, then you can do final tax returns and the assets can be uh, distributed to the heirs. So there's a lot involved in between that and a lot of responsibilities in getting that done. And like Lisa Joe said, sometimes we see that people do the great estate plan. They do the will, the power of attorney, the health surrogate, a trust document, but they leave that one or two baby accounts out and then they've done all this great estate work, but it didn't accomplish everything it could have accomplished. Right. So reviewing those assets before you pass away is, is a great thing to do to make sure that the transition will be smooth. Um, Cause it, probate can be expensive. And one of the hiccups we see is a lot of people have individual stocks like Walt Disney, um, AT&T, there's just like Coca-Cola, certain companies that people have individual stocks. Well, it's hard sometimes for the personal representative to find out where those stock certificates are. So to get those assets transferred, you have to get a medallion stamp with the bank and that in itself oh <laughs> is like a big headache and a long process. So just keep that uh, in mind as well as like a helpful tool to help things uh, transfer more s smoothly. So you definitely want your docs in order. When you have a beneficiary or a transfer on death listed on an account, that overrides anything the will yes. or trust says. 
So be cognizant of that. If you're trying to equalize your estate, you know, those beneficiaries on an account, that's where that money's going to go. It will avoid probate. That money can't be used for anything else except to go to uh, the beneficiaries on that account. So make sure your beneficiaries are updated on your retirement accounts. And a personal financial statement is always a good thing to keep annually and update it. And, you know, you may want to let someone know where that is or give it to them annually for their file. Um, and Lisa Joe's talked to me a lot about, like, the passwords on accounts, you know. And if you notice on this little form, that there's a place for that. And that's one of the things. People need to be able to get into those um, into even your social media and all of that. The, the, um, they passed a um, statute recently. Well, actually, it's not recently anymore. It's been a while. <laughs> but the digital assets um, pass. Now there's all kind of rules with that. And if we don't have that right language and paperwork, it can, it can cause all kind of issues. But just if you've told somebody your login and your password, once you've passed away, you know, if you've got it on a piece of paper, they can at least get in and see what you've got. And that's where these kind of things come in handy. Like I say, there's no magic to what it needs to look like, but have it somewhere where everybody can get to it. And also when those like investment accounts or property transfer to the heirs, they transfer at a stepped up basis. So you get the date of death value. So it's important to work with the financial consultant to make sure when it goes from the social security number into the federal ID number of the new entity that that stepped up basis is picked up and reflected on those statements. And just to reiterate, she mentioned it once, but we keep talking about these baby accounts that really can mess things up and cause more strife later. Just remember, transfer on death, TOD, that is what you need to ask your banker about to be able to put that on those accounts. And another thing to mention, it does stink to kind of go through and think about, like, oh, what happens when I die? Like, what do I want? The more you think about it, the more you put in your will, the better it is for your family. I recently went through my father's death in the past two years, and I work in the industry, and I was overwhelmed with the, the type of questions they ask you when you go to the funeral director, and they're asking you, like, do you want two days? Do you want flowers? Do you want food? Do you, like, the more conversations you have with the family about what they want, you know, when they do, when they do die, just have the conversations because it will save the family so much stress because those, those decisions you're grieving. Yeah. I don't even know, like, what right side was up. It was, yes. When my grandparents passed away, you know, they had the prepaid funeral, but they also actually had the clothes laid out with a big sign, bury me in this. <laughs> well, I was so happy they did that because that was one less thing you had to think about. But, I mean, that's thinking things all the way yeah. through. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and uh, along those lines, I mean, you just have to make sure that, every single one of these little things are taken care of and they seem like they're saying it, they seem overwhelming well you know you can go and, and I definitely recommend as you're thinking about this we don't have somebody from from the funeral home here but we've got some great some great planners for that around as well I, I my caution to you and I think everybody here would tell you the same is make sure you're comparing apples to apples when you do go do that prepaid funeral because not all of them are the same. Some of them don't transfer to another state. Some of them there's additional expenses if you die out of state and you have to come back. Some of them that's included. So you just need to make sure. And now while you're not, and, that, and this is where, you know, the other thing, exactly what Dean is talking about, you get to plan your funeral. If you want it elaborate, you've paid for it. You've got it exactly the way you want it, down to the music and everything if you want. But if you want it to be simple, and you know, then you say, then you've got that planned out. And you tell, you tell your kids or whomever, this is what I want. I've already got it done. Don't do anything else. By not knowing, you, you, the family, just exactly what they're talking about, the family doesn't know. And you're feeling guilty. And you think you need to do, you know, oh my gosh, what will they think if we don't do this and that and the other? You know what? I was just at a funeral last week. And it was beautiful, and I don't—I have no idea. I didn't pay much attention to what the casket really looked like. I didn't, you know, as a as a visitor, I was just sad for the family. But you don't think about that when you're when you're the one going through the grief of the person that you've lost. You 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 know, oh my gosh, I need the biggest and best flowers and all that kind of stuff. 
If you plant it yourself, you get whatever you get what you want, and you've taken that pressure off the family. So, question. Yeah. Can you talk about real estate, like your sure. residents and yeah. real properties? Yeah, real property. With, uh, yeah. Sure. The panelists, when they ask a question, make sure you repeat the question and your okay. answer for the online audience. Okay. So the question was, can we discuss how real estate passes, and and are there ways that we can even avoid probate, and what happens with real estate? So. The short answer is, if you die with real estate in your individual name, there will have to be a probate wherever that real estate is. So this is where a lot of times you may not need a trust for tax purposes or for other purposes, but if you own several parcels of real estate in, in, in other states, it a lot of times makes sense for us to, to put you in a trust so that those so that you've just got one administration that you have to go through and it's a much more abbreviated hopefully administration than what the probate process and having to do it in each of those states however just as just as Dina was talking about on bank accounts if you own your if you own your real estate and this is where so many people try to try to do this themselves oh I'm just gonna add you know Susie to my deed don't, don't do, do that <laughs> we're I mean you the whole room in here would echo don't do that you've messed up your step up in basis you've caused all kinds of crazy problems that you don't need and you may or may not have done it the way had the right language in it to where it still might have to go through probate so anytime you're thinking of doing those things florida and about half of the states do have what what i refer to as a transfer on death deed it's not it's got a technical name but that makes it easier for everybody to understand and any other estate planning attorney or financial planner in another state will recognize it too. But so there's ways we can even not have to, if, you're, if everything's in Florida, we can do these, these deeds that don't have a, uh, they're not considered a present gift for the IRS or Medicaid or any of those purposes. They don't, they don't affect a mortgage. So if you've still got a mortgage on your house, you can still do one of these deeds because it's not a present it's not a present gift. You still retain the whole bundle. You can still sell it. You can still, you, I always say, you can burn it down if you want to. Nobody, your kids can't get mad at you. They don't, they, or whoever you have as those beneficiaries that are on that deed. They can't get mad at you. They are, you know, you, and you can change your mind and say, oh, I'm mad at Susie. I'm going to give it to Tommy, you know, whatever. But we can, those deeds are there, but do not try to do it yourself. You need to do it with a lawyer um, because if you don't get the words right, then you've messed that up too. So, yeah, it, like Lisa just said, don't just go add somebody's name on there for a reason. And when you put property in a trust, you can still, the revocable trust, you still keep your homestead exemption. Yes. So um, there's no harm, no foul. Um, and if you do have property, sometimes it's good to talk about what you want done with that property when you pass. Like, mm -hmm. if you've got a lot of kids, you don't want them fighting over things and you're trying to equalize stuff. So sometimes maybe you just put in the will, please sell this and distribute the cash. Or if you have a beach house that you want to stay in the family a long time, consider maybe putting it in an LLC or something and funding a bank account to keep that going for 10 years. So analyze you know the purpose of the properties that you have and what your intent is long term for those yes you mentioned you keep the homestead exemption if you have a revocable trust what if you for whatever reason after consulting with you know or whatever you want to have a not revocable trust do you still keep the homestead exemption no I, I, can, can you repeat the question sure the question is, do you continue to keep the homestead exemption if your homestead is placed into an irrevocable trust? So those would be the Veterans Legacy Trust, and some, there's, sometimes there's other reasons for people to have irrevocable trusts. And you know, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm embarrassed that I don't because I don't, I've never had it come up. I would think because with, a, with an irrevocable trust, you as the grantor and you as the beneficiary have no longer any control over it. My gut would be you lose the homestead exemption. So I'm just you law school exam I right here for me. <laughs> Sorry James. about that. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> so, but Thumbs yeah. Up. So if you want to maintain and and in our that just homestead happened to be what I wrote about in the supplement. Um, 
there's two kinds of homestead in Florida. You've got, so there's two things that people talk about, and that kind of confuses people as well. There is the homestead exemption, which is created by the Florida Constitution. That's the one that says creditors can't kick you out of your house if it's your homestead. You know, when, if you file bankruptcy, you get to keep your house, those sorts of things. Same thing when, um, when you pass away. Creditors can't make a claim except for the mortgage company. But creditors can't make a claim against your homestead. That passes to your children free of, free of creditors' claims. But you got to you got to jump through the you know do those. But, um, but then there is the homestead exemption that everybody thinks about for the taxes that you get the twenty five thousand or you know whatever all the different uh, ones that they've got out there. That is a statutory tax exemption. If it would be much easier if they didn't call it the same thing because it, it gets very confusing for family members. You can qualify for the homestead that protects you from creditors without having even ever filed for homestead on your, on, on your homestead for the tax purpose. Um, the other thing that where this comes in when we talked about death certificates, death certificates can play a part in messing up whether you get to keep that homestead exemption with um, that has the uh, claims that keep protects you from the claims against creditors. If you don't have the residence as the homestead on the death certificate, they've got all the different things. The residence has to be that homestead address. Even if you were in an assisted living, if you hung on to your house, the government says we expect we 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 know everybody wants to return home if they can. And so there's a legal fiction that gets created that you're going to return to your home even if we know that you're never going to. So it maintains its homestead status. Um, under, I mean, you got there's things you have to do for that. But that's where when you go through the death certificate, make sure the residence is that. Um, or, or maybe you were, you'd moved in with the kids for that last month or so. Yes, you died at your child's house but the residence is still your residence. So it's, and, and we can always get the death certificate amended, but it just, there's another, you know, takes some time and another expense. I just want to mention something quickly with Homestead. I know a lot of people here have beach houses that have been in the family for a long time, and maybe the property taxes haven't been reassessed in a very long time. And also with the boom on real estate down here and real estate prices, um, that when you actually decide like, hey, I'm going to move from Illinois and come down to Florida and file my homestead exemption. When you decide to file your homestead exemption, if they haven't looked at your property in 20 years, they're going to be looking at that property and all of a sudden, maybe you're paying $5,000 in property tax, you could be paying $20,000 in property tax. So please, when you are moving down here from another state to become a Florida resident, to talk to someone before you file for homestead exemption, and it's the right choice for you because of property taxes as well. So I think we're going to turn it over to Amy so she can introduce the next panel. And we have business cards in the back, and we've all um, published articles in the supplement, so you can also get our information there. Thank you. So, yeah, great job, ladies. Hancock Bank and Whitney Bank first worked together in 1918. In 2011, the two banks merged to become one company built on five timeless values, strength and stability, honor and integrity, commitment to service, teamwork, and personal responsibility. With this foundation, our mission is to help you reach your dream. One bank, one mission, 100 years in the making. Hancock Whitney, your dream, our mission.